One book, Matthew. What are we studying here? Well, we're studying the very most popular gospel of the four canonical gospels. The reason Matthew is first in the canon is it was first in the hearts of many of the earliest Christians. Uh, they loved the fact that it was a complete gospel. It had birth narratives, unlike Mark. It had a death and resurrection narratives, also um, in some ways unlike the ending of Mark as well. So it was one-stop shopping, in addition to which Matthew also had these large blocks of teaching. The Gospel of Matthew is not structured like Mark, the earlier Gospel. It's not structured like Luke or John. It's different. It's got alternating blocks of teaching and blocks of activity. And this is, in some ways, an artificial construction because we know Jesus didn't say to his disciples, okay, this, this week, boys, I'm only a talking head. Next week, I'm just doing miracles, not saying anything. No, this is a literary structure. And, and so we're, as we're working through the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to notice that there are six major blocks of teaching. And this cannot be accidental because, of course, to Moses is attributed five books or five major blocks of teaching. So one of the not-so-subtle messages of the Gospel of Matthew is, here is somebody even greater than Moses in regard to fundamental teaching, as we'll see as we go through the book. But something else about the Gospel of Matthew. In some ways, it's the most Jewish of our four Gospels as well. The author is clearly a Jewish follower of Jesus, and he's not all that comfortable using the word God. He uses circumlocutions. So in Matthew, instead of it being the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom of heaven. There are all of these concerns in the Gospel of, of Matthew about matters Jewish of various sorts. There's a long genealogy at the beginning. There's all these issues like korban or pay, paying the temple tax or doing one thing or another that only early Jews would do and which later Christians who were mostly Gentile were not concerned with. Probably the author is writing to Jewish Christians and providing them with a guide to discipleship as they follow Jesus. The provenance of the gospel might be Antioch, it might be Damascus, it might be uh, even in Galilee, say Capernaum, where we know that there was a meeting place for Christians in the house of Peter's mother-in-law. So this is a very Jewish flavored gospel from start to finish, and it's one that highlights the teachings of Jesus far more than the gospel of Mark does, and even more than either John or Luke does as well. Something else about the Gospel of Matthew, it highlights Peter. We're going to see this in one of our later sessions. We're in the middle from about Matthew 14 through 17 or 18. There are all these stories about Peter, and there's been a lot of speculation as to why that is so in this particular Gospel. Another fast fact about Matthew, 95% of the Gospel of Mark is found in Matthew. And of that 95%, some 55% is verbatim. Now, if I have students, two students, who present me with term papers, and 95% of one term paper is in the other term paper with a 55% verbatim rate, I'm going to know there's a literary relationship between these two books. Matthew clearly is dependent on Mark for a good deal of his outline his major sort of bone structure to his gospel. But to this, he's added those six blocks of teaching, which we mostly don't find in the Gospel of Mark. So when was this book written? Well, this book was probably written somewhere in the 80s or 90s, maybe as early as the 70s, but clearly after the Gospel of Mark, since it's dependent on the Gospel of Mark. Why is it attributed to Matthew? Well, presumably because he is one of the more famous sources of the material. For example, he could be uh, the source of the birth narratives. You need to understand that the attribution on the gospel is something that was added later. The gospel actually begins with verse 1 about the genealogy, and it ends at the end of Matthew 28. What it does not do is tell us internally who the author actually is. So the fact that it's attributed to Matthew uh, must be explained by the fact that some of the unique 
source material presumably, has come from Matthew himself. And maybe the very first block, of Matthew 1 and 2, is what came from Matthew, and so it's attributed to him in the second century. What we know as well is that the attribution according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John, was added to these Gospels after there was a collection of more than one Gospel. Because you don't say the Gospel according to X unless there's also the Gospel according to Y or Z. So, the Gospel of Matthew, rich in teaching material, all kinds of interesting things about Peter. We are going to have a great journey through this Gospel in the next eight weeks, and I hope that you will stick with the program and go through all of the sessions as we do so.